Welcome to Magical Arcanum. I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Letson, and we are so glad you are here because it's story time. Planeswalkers are a huge part of the magic story, but the game itself does not explain them very well. So I thought, as we head into Corset 2021, now would be a great time to answer some of the more commonly asked questions I see regarding these characters. A bit of a Planeswalker 101. But first, a big thank you to everyone who helps make this show possible through their support on Patreon. Learn about the benefits you can unlock by becoming a patron yourself using the link down below. Okay, so what are Planeswalkers? Where do they come from and why are they all over the magic story? Hmm? Well, to understand that, first you have to know where you fit into the game itself. That's because you yourself are a Planeswalker. That's right, your deck represents all the locations you've visited and all the things you've learned as you've traveled around the multiverse. Planeswalker cards are supposed to represent you calling upon a fellow Planeswalker friend to help you in your current battle. That's all well and good, but it doesn't really tell us how somebody becomes a Planeswalker or what that even really means, so let me back up a bit. Magic takes place in a multiverse made up of a vast number of individual planes. There is not an infinite number of planes, but there are probably enough that we will never run out of new ones as long as the game is still around. Now, for the people living on a plane, they think that's it. They are unaware of any other planes, so most citizens live their whole life believing they are alone in the universe, not realizing they are part of a greater multiverse. Enter the Planeswalkers, as the name would suggest. These characters are not only aware of other planes, but they can travel around them at will. And this is the core of Magic's ongoing story. Characters who have their own home plane become Planeswalkers and get involved in adventures that span multiple planes. To become a Planeswalker, you must first be born with a spark. This is an innate magical property that appears in about one person out of a million. So the odds of any individual on a plane actually being a planeswalker is quite small. But it gets worse because not only do you need a spark, it must become ignited. Otherwise it does nothing. So how is that worse? How does one ignite a spark? Well, it is almost always the direct result of intense personal trauma. Let me give you a few examples. This is Elspeth. Her spark ignited when she was tortured by the Phyrexians. And I enjoy mentioning them every once in a while because I know people are waiting for me to do a video just about them. And someday I will. Chandra here had her spark ignite when she was about to be publicly executed by a man named Baral on her home plane of Kaladesh. Nyssa discovered her home plane, Zendikar, was infested by the Eldrazi, and the realization of the impending doom caused her spark to ignite. Now, when a spark ignites, it causes your first planeswalk, but it happens at random. You don't pick where you go. It just fires and drops you somewhere new, sort of like a self-preservation mechanism. It takes you out of the traumatic spot you were in and hopefully does not drop you into a worse one. That's what happened to Vraska, the Gorgon assassin from Ravnica. Her first planeswalk took her to an underground cavern. She thought she had died or at least was blinded, but it turns out it was just really dark. So once they figure out what happened, most new planeswalkers start to navigate around and explore the multiverse. Some eventually return home, but others never come home. Remember, it was usually something really traumatic that made them leave there in the first place. There is one other crucial bit to all of this. Planeswalkers used to be a lot more powerful than they are today, and that's thanks to an event called the Mending. Originally, planeswalkers were practically immortal. They could shapeshift, and they were immune to just about everything shy of another planeswalker's power. Eventually, though, there was the Mending, a multiverse reset button. I won't get into the details of it here, but it rewrote the rules of Planeswalkers, making them much less powerful than they had been before. Except for Oko, I guess. 
Anyway, today we classify planeswalkers as pre-mending or post-mending. Pre-mending walkers include Nicol Bolas, Ugin, Soren Markov, and Nahiri. They're all still alive today and suffered through losing some portion of their powers. Meanwhile, characters like Teo, Chandra, Garrick, Basri, they were all born after the mending, so they don't even know what they're missing. This whole mending business has a sort of butterfly effect on the magic story today. Recently, Nicol Bolas used the Elder Spell during the War of the Spark on Ravnica to try and harvest the sparks of countless planeswalkers in a vain attempt to restore some of the power he had lost during the mending. So that's the fundamentals of planeswalkers. Today, they're just as mortal as you and me, but they can travel around the multiverse in a way that nobody else can. On a previous video on this channel, a viewer named Ben Thurston posted several questions relating to Planeswalkers specifically, so I'm going to attempt to answer those as best as I can, paraphrasing his original post where appropriate. Number one, are there limits to Planeswalking? How often can they do it? And how much effort does it take? The act of Planeswalking does take considerable effort. Yes, most characters seem to get tired of doing it after just one or two Planeswalks within a single day. Uh, there is a spot in the War of the Spark novels where the Planeswalker Ral Zarek attempts to chase another Planeswalker named Tezzeret across multiple planes. Ral becomes clearly exhausted after just a handful of those Planeswalks. We also know that for most characters, starting a planeswalk takes a bit of focus. The exception to this is the Wanderer, for whom things work in reverse. She has to focus to stay on her current plane, otherwise she will planeswalk away at random without really trying. The Wanderer is currently one of the biggest mysteries in Magic, and I recently did a video that goes more into detail about her, so go ahead and check that one out if you haven't already. There does not seem to be any hard limit in place. It mostly comes down to how well rested you are or how motivated you are to attempt another planeswalk. A character on the run for their life could probably squeeze out a few more than someone just exploring for the fun of it, for example. Question uh, batch number two, I guess. How long does it take and how do people pick where they are going? This is also going to be technically different for each character, but it seems like for most of them, after about 10 seconds of focus, they can initiate their planeswalk, which then happens almost instantaneously. That is, they arrive at their destination within a few seconds, but the exact mechanics of how that happens are still mysterious. We know it involves passing through the blind eternities. This is the space that connects all those separate planes. Crossing through the Blind Eternities is a lot like opening a door that connects you to another location. Think of the portals from Doctor Strange, only you can't look through it first to see the other side. Anyone can go through one of Doctor Strange's portals, but only Planeswalkers can cross through the Blind Eternities. Anybody without a spark will be killed by the chaotic energies contained within the Aether there. And before you go reaching for your keyboard, I know there are exceptions to that. Magic is a game of exceptions. With so many cards that change the game's own rules, it's only fair that the story get the same treatment once in a while, right? Anyway, walking through the blind eternities without a spark is fatal. Planeswalkers can track other planeswalkers through there though, at least initially after they planeswalk. They leave behind a sort of energy trail that only other planeswalkers can detect. But how do you find any place new? Well, it's never officially explained anywhere, but this is my take on it. You have your first random planeswalk, which takes you to a new spot. Your internal map now has two locations on it. Every planeswalker seems to know how to instinctively get back home, whether or not they actually want to go there again. Imagine you are in a car on your way from home to the store. Maybe you're a kid in the back seat with one of your parents driving. This is a lot like your first random planeswalk. You don't have a lot of control over where you go. But even though it's a short trip, you're aware of these other locations as you pass. You can't see inside these houses and stores, 
but you get an impression of their doorway as you go whipping past at 30 miles an hour. And so, during that first random planeswalk, even though it only takes a moment, the new planeswalker probably got the impression of a few other planes as they were taken to their new random one. So that gives them a really rough internal map, right? And they can choose to go back to any of those spots that maybe looked interesting, or they can follow the trail of another walker to a different spot that they hadn't even seen in passing. As for how specific they can pick their destination, well, Jace is able to return right to his office on Ravnica, but that's probably because he knows it really, really well. In another story that takes place on Zendikar, Jace was contemplating planeswalking within the same plane back to a camp where he was going to meet up with Gideon, but he didn't know it that well, and he figured if something went wrong and he missed his target, he could wind up surrounded by Eldrazi and too tired to try again right away. So he decides to spend like two days walking instead. So we can take that all to mean the more familiar you are with a location, the more targeted your planeswalk there can be. But if it's your first time arriving somewhere, you're not going to have a lot of control over where you wind up. Question batch number three. How does mana play into all of this? Why are planeswalkers specific colors? And can they ever get mana screwed like I do when I play the game? Remember earlier in this video when I said that your deck represents all the places you've been as a planeswalker? Those are your lands. The more lands you've got, the more well-traveled you are, the more mana you're able to call upon to cast your spells. The same is roughly true for the planeswalkers in the story. Traveling to different planes allows them to forge a bond with the lands there, and that does give them access to more mana and more power, allowing them to grow over time, reflective of their travels. As for the colors, that's a topic probably too big for this video, but in short, the characters in the magic story do not recognize the different colors of mana the way we do as players. Nyssa, for example, does not consider herself a green character. She just knows she has a natural affinity for elementals, and when she visits a plane, she's able to tap into its ley lines, a sort of wellspring of mana. This is kind of like the ramp spells that exist on green cards. Meanwhile, a character like Jace uses mental magic because that's where his talents naturally lie, but he would not describe himself as being a blue wizard. I will point out, however, most of Jace's best character growth happened while he was on Ixalan, which itself is a large island, so take that for what you will. Can they ever be mana screwed? Yes, sort of. Depending on their situation, a planeswalker can find it harder or easier to cast the spells that they like. Liliana once remarked that she found a smoothness to her magic on Innistrad that she did not find anywhere else. So we could interpret that to mean that that plane is just lush with black mana, and that's really great for her. Conversely, during the events of Amonkhet, Liliana brought forth a shade to use as a scout. It was described in the story as being very weak, and since a shade is a type of creature that gets stronger the more mana you're able to give it, we could interpret that to mean Liliana did not have mana to spare in this instance. Ral Zarek uses a custom piece of equipment called an accumulator to bank up his lightning because he knows he won't always have access to a stormy sky, especially if he's indoors. So in that way, he's kind of preparing for himself to be mana screwed by using an artifact, the same way you might put, I don't know, mana lift into your deck. Ben, I hope that that answers some of your questions and gives everyone a better understanding of Planeswalkers in general. They are such a fun topic, though, I could not help but close this video out with a mustache minute. So get ready. Here we go. Did you know the first five Planeswalker cards appeared in Lorwyn in 2007? They were foreshadowed by Tarmogoyf, of all things, earlier that year in Future Sight. The original Planeswalker designs behaved a lot more like the sagas we have now. They would come into play, and then each turn they would just trigger the next of their abilities in order over and over again, but the designers felt that that made them too robotic, so instead we got the loyalty system that we have now today. Which lets you experience the way more interactive play patterns as only Teferi can bring you. <clears throat>
Anyway, those Lorwyn Five are supposed to be the iconic representations of what each color planeswalker is all about. So let's take a closer look at them. A Johnny! Probably the worst out of the initial five. He can gain you a little bit of life, which is a very white ability, I admit. He can put counters on creatures that you already have on the board, but that doesn't really help you if you're falling behind. His ultimate ability makes an avatar creature token that gets smaller as you take damage. So really, I think a Johnny is fine if you're already winning. He's probably what we would call a win more card, but I would not count him to get me out of a bad situation. Jace, his abilities are all about drawing cards or milling them, which are definitely blue abilities, no doubt there. He was also the most popular of the original Lorwyn 5, probably thanks to having the lowest casting cost out of all of them. Liliana. So this version of her doesn't do any zombie stuff, but it does do some classic black moves, like making your opponent discard cards and bringing everything back from the graveyard. Even that middle ability of hers, which works great with Vevictus as Mahdi as your commander, by the way, that is still representative of the classic black tutor cards. It's kind of funny because after this version, Liliana becomes like queen of swamps for some reason, before ultimately becoming the necromancer we all know and love. Chandra, five mana to deal one damage to your opponent. Feels like they were really afraid to put the good effects on the positive loyalty abilities, but all of her moves here do feel very red. She can throw fireballs at things, and you can even customize how big they are because she's the first Planeswalker to have an X cost in her abilities. That brings us to Garrick, who is kind of straddling the line here between caring about creatures and caring about lands. Those would eventually be handed over to Nyssa, but for this first version of a green Planeswalker, it is decidedly not as busted as the ones they've been giving us lately. In my most humble of opinions, the best Planeswalker cards are the uncommon and rare ones from War of the Spark. The uncommons especially, because these feel like a friend popping in to say hello and check up on you and then peacing out. Remember, this is supposed to be your fight, not something Teferi comes in and wins for you. I especially like this version of Chandra because she shows up and she starts giving you new ideas exactly the way a spontaneous red character would. She doesn't actually execute them herself though. You still have to pay mana for those extra cards and they only stick around for the one turn so you've got to act impulsively. She can protect herself as she takes damage she will retaliate but she doesn't like create an army of tokens or start killing all the bad guys things. You've got to protect her and she'll keep giving you new ideas. That is a really flavorful way to capture a planeswalker showing up for your battle. What do you think? Should planeswalkers only be mythic? Should they set the tone for the whole game? Should they be guest stars that appear alongside your creatures and other spells? Let me know down in the comments and then make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the great stories you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. We'll see you.